partner, confidant, and mogul in the making, Pat the Manager Corcoran helped Chance the Rapper steer an independent course, and together the two upended the music industry. This is his blueprint. And we did that cover out in, uh, was it Boulder? That cover right there? Yeah. It was in Boulder. That was a crazy day. Yeah. First time we met, right? Yep. 2013. We're ready. Are we ready? ready? Tell me a little bit about your family growing up. I grew up in the north side of Chicago in a neighborhood called Saugenash, which is blue collar. My mom was a physical therapist. She retired about 10 years ago. And um, my dad works in the futures business. He's a chairman and CEO of a large independent um, clearinghouse, futures clearinghouse. I think, you know, most kids grow up with like idols like Michael Jordan or like Kanye West. For me, when I grew up, my parents were my idols. My dad was always just incredible. What were the things that he imparted to you about business that still stick with you? The first thing I remember him teaching me about was reputation. When I was little, I have a little brother, Jerry. Um, me and him were free spirits. <laughs> and um, not in the sense of like being bad kids, but we just did what we wanted to do. Just stay out late or, you know, fool around in class, and my dad would always drill into us, like, your reputation is everything, you know? It, it's what precedes you, and it's what people are gonna know about you after you're gone. You know, as, as a kid in high school, did you have any sort of sense of professional purpose or, like, aspiration? No, I didn't. In high school, I, I you know, I think like everybody, we bounced back and forth. I really didn't know, which is normal, I think, you know? When did it start to come into focus for you? At the same time I was on the varsity football team, I was also on the honors choir. And choir changed my life. I really loved, like, fell in love with music and, and learned a lot about music. When I got to college, I met my friends who I work with today, and we started a music blog, and that was sort of like the beginning of, of what you're seeing now. For us, it was just more fun than a career. And then we got into throwing shows and then doing music videos and then pretty much just helping artists in any way. Were you completely putting this together on the fly or did you have some mentorship? At that time, it was completely on the fly. Like, no mentors, no help, no nothing. And our first show, like, flopped. It was awful. Who, who was headlining? Rhyme Fest. Okay. Yeah, and we did Lincoln Hall. Um, the Lincoln Hall folks here in Chicago I grew up with the, the son of the guy who started Shubas in Lincoln Hall. So when I wanted to do my first show, I was like, yo, give me a great deal and we'll throw the show and it'll just be like a showcase where we'll bring a bunch of artists together. It flopped, we sold like 100 tickets. And like we owed the venue like 1,500 bucks at the end of the night. And it was like such a blow to all of our egos. And What, what went wrong? We just didn't know what the fuck we were doing. <laughs> but like, we tried it, you know? And then like, through trying it, we learned so much about what we wanted to do, right? So I think we promoted it maybe for only two weeks with like flyers. It was tough. I remember calling my dad and being like, I need you to give me some money so I can pay Lincoln Hall. Okay. And uh, I stopped trying to be a promoter and w what led me from doing the shows to eventually getting into artist management was I met Kids These Days, which was Vic Mensa, mm -hmm. Nico Segal, Greg Landfair, Lane Beckstrom, Macy Stewart. I was like, yo, I need to like, I need to do anything I can do for you guys. What can I do? You know, can I go to Dunkin' Donuts for you guys? Can I pick up some weed for you guys? You know, can I do, can I buy, can I throw a party for you guys? I sort of just like, was around, you know, try to be around it as much as I could. And their manager, um, Demo, who's a legendary, like, Chicago radio slash management figure, he was like, yeah, come on. And I sort of just, like, shadowed Demo for about a year. And that meant, like, going to McDonald's or selling merch at the merch table. I'd drive to North Carolina, we'd set everything up, I'd run the merch table, we'd break everything down, put it back in the sprinter, and then I'd drive back home. In one night? In one day, yeah. Doing that kind of work for that amount of time takes a certain amount of determination mm. and humility um, and, and just drive. Mm. Where do you think those things came from? I think the humility definitely from my parents. 
You know, it was natural for me to be, I'm not better than anyone else, and um, you got to work hard, right? When I got with kids these days, it grabbed me. I felt like, I think I can be the fucking best at this. And for me, I never really had anything that, that took hold of me like this music stuff did when I was 20 years old. Were you making any real money doing the kids these days stuff? No, I didn't get paid anything. So this was almost like an internship, basically? Pretty much, yeah. But My yeah. dad still calls my job to this day the best paying internship of all time. <laughs> But him calling it that helps me like take away the lessons that I can from it, you know? And he encourages that. He's like, learn as much as you can. Like, this is fucking crazy. As you're doing this, you don't have that same financial pressure that a lot of artists in those early days have, mm -hmm. that they have to make these things work, right? Mm -hmm. One of my friends uh, put it best to me. <laughs> he goes, you know, your parents are, they've done great for themselves, but you went and you did it harder than anyone else and it's not because you had an empty stomach you did it because you felt it and that it was internal and that you wanted it and he was like that's fucking rare man during the course of that time you meet chance mm. tell me about your introduction we didn't have the most friendly exchange to begin with because i was like at a i was we were at a my friend's apartment we were throwing a party i think it was for like it was one of the band members' birthdays. But Chance was always just like this guy at the party who's just causing a scene, you know? But it was fun-loving, you know? It wasn't like negative, sort of like me in high school. I think like they spilled a bunch of water on the floor, or beer on the floor, or whatever. And I was like, Jesus, man, who did this shit, you know? <laughs> and Chance would always be right there like looking at it. So he's like a high school kid. High school, yeah. And so that was like the first time meeting Chance um, on like a communicative level where we were communicating. And then the next time I saw him was at uh, these legendary 10 day listening parties. So it's like this little six inch platform that Chance was sitting on. He was like doing, he did some to track. And then I remember, I think he did brain cells acapella. I remember that night I was just like, whoa. That's when I was like, holy shit. This is fucking amazing. What was the thing that drew you to him? I think the performance was incredible that night, and that was, like, amazing. So he's, like, pantomiming over the tracks, basically? Yeah, he was killing it. It was just, like, pouring his fucking heart out in front of all these kids. Packed, like, streetwear shop in Chicago. And that was just amazing to see. But that was, like, the first time where I, like, viewed Chance through the lens of, wow, this kid's a musician. This kid's a performer. At that moment, did you, did you know that you wanted to work with him? No. The way that I work with musicians has always come from a place of like, you have to really protect this and build this slowly. And so when I saw him, I was just a pure fan. Like that night at Leaders for me, that's when the legend of Chance started for Pat. So how do you go from being a fan of Chance, working with kids these days, to making that transition to sort of first just go out on your own mm -hmm. and then to you know create this partnership with with him i had stopped working with kids these days right at the end of 2000, 2011 and i'd started working with two rappers from chicago ken bay x and alex wiley in the same capacity that i worked for kids these days and uh, me and a guy by the name of uh, alex riley um, shot a music video for Alex Wiley and Kemby X called Dollar Please. And it was this, you know, awesome video that was shot on a DSLR, just one camera, just riding around the city. We posted it and like XXL picked it up like right away. And I think Complex picked it up and it was sort of like, everyone was like, whoa, what's going on? Like who did this video, this and that. And that was sort of like one of the things that was not in a supportive role, but like, hey, let's take the lead on something and do yeah. this. The next video that we did um, was a Caleb James video that uh, Elijah Alvarado shot in my parents' garage. And uh, Chance came just to hang. I remember they were shooting the video upstairs in the garage and Chance and I were downstairs watching TV, just sort of sitting there, bored. Like, I hate video shoots. I hate being on set at a film. 
And Chance obviously felt the same way that day. So, and I, I told him, I was like, if there's anything I could ever do to work with you, anything you ever need, just let me know. I'll do anything. And he said, oh yeah, cool, what, you know, whatever. And that was that. Two weeks later after that, um, I was driving everybody to the radio station. We picked them up and we went out to the Power 92 radio station in Hammond, Indiana. And um, Chance's dad met us there. And Chance's dad at the time was the Midwest director of the Department of Labor. It was appointed by uh, President Obama. And so he showed up, very nice suit, um, Cadillac, and I was like, whoa, sick. You know, <laughs> like this guy seems awesome. And me and Chance's dad were just started chatting with another guy named Genesis who was Ken Bay and Alex's manager and I was sort of like the sidekick at the time. Mr. Bennett was interested in what was the best way to throw Chance's first show in Chicago. And so Genesis had these ideas and then Mr. Bennett turned towards me and said, what do you think? And I said, you should do a show at Lincoln Hall. You know, it's a you know 500 cap, I think you guys can handle that. It's a little bit newer than Reggie's, which would be the other 500 cap. Um, and Chance had already played a few shows at Reggie's and I just felt like Lincoln Hall was like the new frontier for him. It wasn't as much about the content of the conversation as it was the context and how me and Mr. Bennett connected. And I think he felt that I genuinely cared about Chance and that I was genuinely a fan. A couple weeks had passed. I'd, you know, went to the radio station and met Mr. Bennett and on May 1st I'm sitting at the dinner table having like a birthday dinner with my dad and I got a phone call from Mr. Bennett. This is from a random number and I answered it and he said, Pat? And I said, yeah. He's like, this is uh, Ken Bennett. I want to talk to you. I said, what's up? He goes, you know, I was speaking with Chance and um, we think you'd make a good manager. And I was like, whoa, like completely floored. He's like, I want to meet up with you tomorrow, um, and, ch and I'm going to bring Chance and Taylor, and uh, we'll meet up by leaders, and we'll have some food, and we'll talk about it. So I said, amazing. Thank you so much, and I'll see you tomorrow. And I hung up the phone. I went back to my dad's birthday dinner, sort of told everyone. I was like, something really amazing just happened. And the next day, we'd all gotten together. We had a conversation, probably about an hour long, about how it was all going to work, and... It wasn't any type of like deal-making process. It was more of like a great conversation between friends about how much I cared about Chance and how honored I was to be considered for this opportunity. The conversation was summed up by one thing that Mr. Bennett said, um, which was right at the end. He goes, you know, I know you don't have a lot of experience, but that's okay. Your job is to help Chance get the recognition that he deserves. What I remember vividly was, you know, Michael Jordan wasn't the best basketball player ever. He was just the best known basketball player. So it's your guys' job now to take chance from being really good to being really good, but noticed. You know, whatever you guys don't know now, whatever you don't know, whatever chance doesn't know, you guys will learn it together. And that was like day one. With marching orders from Mr. Bennett, Corcoran got to work. He and Chance would have to learn every aspect of the business while industry execs circled them like sharks in the water. Basically, I just put up some stuff on the walls that I've been really proud about, uh, things that we've accomplished, sort of my Chance cover wall right here that's missing quite a few covers. This cover with Lin-Manuel Miranda, which is really, really cool. and. Um, Noah had all these ideas and his team had a lot of ideas like what do we want to do, what do we want to do and Chance and Lynn were going back and forth and back and forth and actually Noah and I conceptualized this idea and Chance and Lynn actually said yes to it. So these are pictures from Magnificent Coloring Day which took place last September in 2016. This photo is really special to me because Chance his idol Kanye, and myself, and this is in the baseball stadium that I grew up going to baseball games in. These are uh, two things that, that happened to me in the last um, year. This is the Forbes Music 30 Under 30, and this is the Billboard's uh, Rising Stars 40 Under 40. Take me through those, those first few hours, few days, where you go home and start to process this and put together a plan for what this is gonna look like. The next thing I did uh, that day was tell my parents. 
I was like, I'm probably not gonna do school anymore. <laughs> you know, they were pissed. And like, you know, what are you doing? You're throwing your life away type of thing. And they actually made me and my two parents all went to group counseling sessions from that day in May for about six weeks until Chance's show in June. They're like, you're not dropping out of school. No way. Like, don't even know who this guy is. <laughs> Just fair. So I told them, I was like, I'll agree to go to the counseling sessions if you agree to hear me out on this thing. Like, we're going to do this show at Lincoln Hall, and it's going to sell out, and it's going to be crazy. Chance, myself, and Mr. Bennett all got to work on, like, campaigning this 10-day show. It was every day, postering schools. Mr. Bennett was driving us around. He was super involved, and we sold out the show. <laughs> the last counseling session that I go to with my parents, the counselor walks in and says, oh, I heard about the show <laughs> on the radio station on the way into work today. And I look over at my parents, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was the last time we ever went to the counselor. And they said, you got one year. You can pursue this opportunity, and if in one year you haven't made the progress that we think you should make, then you gotta go back to school. So we played Lincoln Hall, and uh, I had sort of a moment of vindication when I walked in, and everyone looked at me like, why the fuck is this guy back? You know, and I think over the course of the night they realized that I'm fucking here to throw the Chance show, motherfucker. <laughs> like, that's, that was like my, I was like, yeah, I'm with fucking Chance bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then on June 8th, we played this Childish Gambino show on First Ave in Minnesota, in Minneapolis. And we were off to the races. So in those first moments with Chance, had the idea of being a completely independent unit, was that something that you guys were talking about? Or were you really just sort of trying to build his celebrity and, and build his following? We started getting the calls, and the independency thing didn't really come up until we started taking the meetings and realizing what it meant to be, a, a, like a signed artist meant. You know, like we didn't know what the contracts looked like, or, or what, what it even all entailed. So we started taking the meetings with the, the idea of just like let's just go and learn something. I wasn't in the position or in the role of saying like, yes or no to people. It was more of like just being there for Chance and helping him filter this, because at the end of the day, that's my style. I'm not, I don't want to be like the, the king, you know? Mm -hmm. But I'll be like a dope, you know, advisor, like a Tyrion, <laughs> you know? A guy who's like, yeah, I'm, I got your back, but at the end of the day, I want you to make a decision for you. What's right for you and your family and for, you know, as you go on into your life, because this is going to be you in this contract, not me. And uh, Sylvia offered us a deal the day we came out to New York, our first time ever going to New York. We were all really excited about it. It was like dope. It meant that we were going in the right direction. And that was in June of 2012. And uh, Chance's parents um, and I and Chance, we all spoke about it because it was like, hey, this is an opportunity. Like maybe we should do this. And uh, what I said to Chance and his dad, I said, you know, I don't think you want to, you know, marry the first label that you date. I think that you want to date around in this scenario. Like, meet people and see what's best. And I think it's, if anything, it's, you're just going to be able to learn more. Mm -hmm. From that and a series of other conversations, we decided, let's take more meetings and see what we can learn. So from there, it was like the meeting season, you know, where we would, we met with everyone from Sylvia Roan to every single, like, cool A&R, Tunji, who at the time was working at uh, Universal. Um, we met with Sycamore, who at the time was working at Def Jam. Um, we met with John Janik. There was a moment sort of like where what happened in the election would weigh in on what would happen with Chance's family. Um, Chance's dad had worked for Barack leading into his presidency um, and then was appointed by Barack and um, you know, obviously being a presidential appointed person in the government, um, things change if there's a switch in the guard, right? I think Chance felt pressure on himself to 
be a provider for his family in, in that case. You know, I think he was really hard on himself and said, hey, if my parents need me, like, I'm going to do what I have to do to, to provide and be a great son for my parents because they've been great to me. But after the election happened and Barack stayed in office, thank God, the pressure was off to, like, make a decision on working with someone and getting an advance check. Were the labels incredulous that you were not jumping at these opportunities that they were offering? Probably at the beginning, but I think they realized that after, you know, a few months of us taking the meetings that we weren't playing the game to up the ante, that we were really out there to learn something. And if you're salty because you didn't sign chance, then you're salty, but at least you could respect that. What we were, what we were trying to do was good for us, and, and it was like an experience, and something that we were learning from. Take me through the, this, you know, the fall of 2012 and 13. This is when Chance really starts to hit the national radar. You're working on acid rap. Did you, as the manager or he as the artist, have any sort of sense of expectation or pointed ambition for what that next project was going to do? Yeah, definitely. So that summer, Nate Fox had sent Chance this beat pack. Chance was in the studio, and he um, he said, I got this beat pack, it's fucking tight. I'm gonna make a whole entire mixtape, these Nate Fox beats, and I'm gonna call it Acid Rap. And that was probably in June or July. So that's like, that's what really like led the charge, you know, for finishing the thing. So in the meetings, we were telling people September, and then we were telling people November, <laughs> and then we were telling people February. And then it was like January, like probably first couple weeks of January. And Chance and I spoke and he goes, and I said, you know, if we're going to make this deadline for February, you know, we should talk about finishing this thing up. And he goes, what's the last Tuesday in April? So I opened up my phone. I went to the calendar. And I said, Tuesday, April 30th. He goes, we'll put it out then. The focus was just getting the project done for basically from that time in June until the project came out with some meetings involved and learning, which was really fun, meeting new people. I mean, if you look at Astrap, there's amazing features on there, which are really fun. We spent a lot of time with Donald um, at his house in Malibu. He was renting out Chris Bosch's house in Malibu, which was like ridiculous. And Chance and I stayed in the master bedroom closet. <laughs> like they had blow up mattresses in the closet of the master bedroom and uh, so we spent a lot of time there and so that was sort of like what the year looked like a lot of traveling a lot of time in the studio um, lots of cigarettes and writing and I would sit there and I'd be with him every day and we'd get business done I'd bother him and say hey what do you think about this what do you think about that and we would just roll that way and you knew you weren't gonna sell this he wanted to sell acid rap like the last couple weeks He's like, let's sell it. And um, I was like, dude, nothing on it is cleared. Like, no way. And uh, he's like, all right, all right, all right. So it was, like, <laughs> it was just like a little fragment in, in the air that was sort of like an elephant standing in the room. Like, duh, like, why don't you guys make some money off this? But at the end of the day, we both, we didn't want anything to get in the way of this thing. I think, you know, January is when we put out Juice. Yeah. And that was like the big moment where everyone had sort of like covered chance and actually when we put out juice we did put it for sale oh really and um we found out about a day after our lawyer called uh, me and he said you guys put out that song for sale there's a sample in it and i was like okay so what I'm like fuck it you know <laughs> being the like you know inexperienced kid that i was and he was like well it's a john lennon interpolation and we we're like He's like, you gotta take it down now or you're gonna have to deal with this bullshit. So we took it down immediately, you know what I'm saying? And uh, you know, we, we kept the project for free. How does your life change when Acid Rap hits? You know, after that project had come out, we pretty much almost immediately got on tour with Mac Miller about six weeks later. Um, and then we were on the road, you know, and like the road just completely sucks you in. And that was a whole experience, our first time being on the road. We got Red Bull to give us a check for $20,000 and we bought a used RV with it. Chance, myself, DJ Oreo, and my buddy from growing up, Danny Cerrone, went out on their own. Danny was the driver, I was the manager, 
Chants and Oreo were performers. And I think we put in on that tour, which was like from mid-June to like the beginning of August, had it been close to 20,000 miles in that RV, which the generator didn't work for three quarters of the time. So meaning the first shows in Texas, 110 degrees in a steel, like aluminum box that didn't have any air conditioning. So it's like a total experience. And beyond just like learning how to tour, figuring out how to advance a show, you know, like without any help, you know? With being the little guy in the situation, chance to turn the fuck up every night, and it was incredible. And it's what everybody wanted, you know? Everyone listened to the project, and everybody wanted to see him live. And then after that, we went and did five shows with Eminem in Europe, which was like ridiculous. When you're doing these shows, are people knowing the words at this point? Not in Europe. In America, for sure. In, in the US, it was like almost Chance and Mac Miller's tour. As all this stuff starts rolling and the opportunities start becoming more and more abundant, it becomes more obvious that what is happening with Chance is going to be enormous. Was there a moment where you guys made the sort of hard decision, like, we are going to do this all ourselves. We are not going to, you know, sign a publishing deal or sign a record contract. You know, there wasn't really one conversation that I can recall where we just said, we're not going to do it, or he said, I'm not going to do it. It was just sort of the unspoken conclusion. Like, <laughs> this is not going to work for us. We're, we're feeling this role already. We don't need the help of a major label. And actually, Chance had refused to hire a lawyer when we go and went and did those meetings. So we'd do a meeting with someone um, like L.A. Reid, <laughs> and they'd be like, who can I send this contract to? And we, we'd be like, well, we don't have a lawyer, so you can't send it to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was like one of our tactics as we did all those meetings. We just want to put out music to feed the streets, really. When do you start thinking about, like, he's gonna have to, we have to administer his publishing. Like someone has to step up and figure that out. Yeah, I mean the publishers will make you feel like you need that stuff. <laughs> you know, there's plenty of people who haven't sold their publishing. They'll make it seem like you need, you need a publisher, you need someone to, you know, find producers for you or songwriters for you. You need someone to get those royalties and collect those royalties. And in some sense on the royalty collection, they're right, but there are other ways to collect royalties outside of signing away your publishing. You set that up though internally within your organization. Yes, yeah, Chance, Chance and I have, and with our teams, you know, and every musician, there's verticals. So there's a booking agent vertical, there's usually a press vertical, there's a business management vertical, there's a legal vertical, there's a management vertical. Through Chance's desire to remain independent, we had to build all of those teams proprietarily. With no background in it? None. How did that go? The first team that we built was the merch team. So like I bought shopchancetherapper.com. We put up the merch and we started making it at a local merch shop with no relationship, just found a merch shop. Hey, print this, I gotta ship it out this week. And then what was next, PR? Press, yeah. And I think with press, it's more of just managing it, you know, especially when you have so much, so much excitement like Chance and someone who's so genuine and real as Chance, it's easy to do press for. As we got into, from acid rap going into the surf days, that's where we really developed our chops in the record making, the publishing conversations with, okay, we're gonna make a fully cleared record and I gotta figure out how much publishing to give to this producer and that producer and this feature and that songwriter. And that was the first time for all of us. And So you're uh, negotiating splits and thinking about clearances and all of that. Advances, yeah, sample clearances. And uh, that's where we got our, our first taste of clearing a record. And um, it could be really fun, it could be really hard, but yeah, you know, we, we were able to get surf off, you know, we had an amazing release with Apple where we put it out for free on the iTunes store. Um, Did you have any mentorship or were you literally just like picking up the phone and calling? At the time I had met um, Tim Smith, who is a manager uh, for Skrillex and for Zed. And he recommended a book, um, which was uh, everything that you need to know about the music industry. 
which is uh, by Donald Passman, uh, who's an entertainment lawyer to this day. And it's pretty much the Bible when it comes to working in the music industry. For anyone who wants to understand the music industry, if you know that book, you're miles and miles ahead of anyone else in the game. Um, and that's where I got a lot of my chops from going into the surf process. I was reading that book every day. Take me through how you and Chance make your creative decisions. It's all chance and I'm a sounding board. I don't view myself as someone who makes decisions for any of the people that I work with. I'm gonna give you the statistics on it, I'm gonna give you the analytics, I'm gonna give you my input and my perspective, and I'll tell you, here's this idea I came up with, here's all of the facts on it. Now, you know, you, you do what you wanna do. You know, there'll be, there'll be a fork in the road, right? Decision that we have to make, and we duke it out, right? And then as soon as we come to an answer, whether it's something that I initiated or whether he initiated, whatever we decided on, like he's leading the charge. And like, even if I hated the idea, like I'm right, you know, right behind him, like, or I'm right in front of him, like full backing it all the way to the end zone. As Chance's fame surged beyond all expectation, he and Corcoran prepared to launch their biggest project yet but the two had no idea the opposition that they would face in that defining moment. In December of 2012, I moved in here with Eric Montanez, my partner, and I was just ramping up with all the chance stuff. So we're like, let's get into huge space and just like live together um, and, uh, and work together. And that was upstairs. And when we lived upstairs, this whole entire space was a dollar store. So we moved in, we actually bought like our first like knife and like pots and pans from this dollar store. You'll see upstairs like it's a great apartment, it's like a little lofty vibe, but we had boxes and boxes and boxes of merch and shit everywhere. So you're running the whole chance operation out of that. Out of upstairs. Uh, and we did that from December of 2012 until about September of 2014. Last year you guys put out coloring book. And this was the first time that you had signed any sort of deal around the music that you were creating. This was not a record deal, but it was a deal um, with Apple Music. What was the thinking that you and Chance were having in the moments that led up to that? We wanted to put the project in the hands of someone who was going to take the project seriously, who understood Chance, who loved the music and would be a champion for that music. We took all the meetings and the phone calls. We spoke with everyone. Tidal, SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Music, even smaller streaming services like Audiomack. It was sort of like taking meetings as a high school all-star athlete and going to different colleges and seeing who's gonna care about us the most and who's gonna help us put us in the right position to win and succeed and have a great career in the majors, right? You know, at the end of the day, we went with the company that um, believed in Chance most and who showed it the most. And it wasn't about the money, it was about the people inside that building uh, who are incredible and they're still there and doing a great job today with some newer artists. And uh, they, were, they were on the wave and they really felt it. When you guys did that deal, there was outsized backlash, uh, particularly on social, the feeling that this somehow negated the stance towards independence. His independence, yeah. Do you think that that was a fair criticism? I would say absolutely not. In no way, shape, or form would that take away any of his metal. Or we built the record. It just came out on their platform. It, like, when I had to clear that record, it's Pat, 25-year-old at the time, on the phone with the CEO of Def Jam. Like, duking it the fuck out about Justin Bieber and Kanye West and getting their publishing and their masters cleared. It wasn't an executive from Apple on that fucking phone. It was me and Chance. You know? It wasn't an executive at Apple who made the decisions about what the cover would look like or what the date would be. Saying that because we decided to release it with someone who cared about Chance more than someone else uh, would take away from the independency that we have created is asinine. No, no one outside of our business had a hand in finishing this record or putting out this record. 
We did exactly what we wanted to do. We cleared the record, we built the record. Chance worked his ass off on creating the songs, writing every song, all the features, all the production, all the arrangements. No one outside of our camp was involved in the creation or the release of this project. I was gonna ask, you know, on the chorus to um, Problems, uh, chances if one more label tries to stop me. Have you guys found that uh, as you move independently, the major players in the space are trying to stick, uh, stick in your spokes? Different people will do different things to get a leg up on the competition. I think Chance and I, I know that Chance and I are more wholesome than that, but some people aren't as wholesome in this industry. Going into the situation thinking that it was going to be relatively easy to clear a coloring book with those types of artists on it, so Justin Bieber, Kanye West. It took the wind out of my sails when the first thing I heard from the Def Jam CEO was no way, you know? Not gonna happen, no way in fucking hell. Like, Bieber's got an album out, Kanye just dropped his album, no fucking way are you taking you know, the fuel from our fire and putting on Chance's bonfire, you know? We just kept on knocking on that door and kept on being the good guys and being centered about it and being wholesome about it and creating the right deal that would make everyone happy. But at the end of the day, Chance had written five songs for Kanye in the months prior for their biggest artist, one of their biggest artists of all time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when they're like, well, you know, why are we supposed to allow you to do this? And the retort would be, why are we supposed to allow you guys to keep the Kanye record up when we worked on it? Those were tough conversations to have, especially with being so close to the Kanye camp. I'll bring you upstairs where everything sort of started, really. Okay. Like where are we? Are there there are guys that work this is with where you we that, like, that still live there now? Yeah, you're all good. This is Clark. He works with us. Hey, um, Clark. What's good, man? We uh, what up, Clark? As you can see, it hasn't changed a lot. Um, a lot of our younger dudes live here, okay, which is fun, and uh, it's a really fun space to host artists at. We have we still have artists to this day come through and chill. This tiny little office here behind this wall was the first merch, the first installment of the merch story. And then right here on this side of the wall, there was a desk with two computers. Me and Eric opened up our laptops, and this is where we hit go on Acid Rap, where we released Acid Rap from. When you, when you first met with Mr. Bennett, he gave you the marching orders to sort of make Chance famous or to make him achieve the ubiquity that his talent deserves. Has that mission changed over time? No. I think, um, I think what my mission is is to help create the best opportunities and make the best of everything that is in front of us and even things that are not in front of us. Um, I think what I was given that day, that opportunity, this responsibility was, we have to make the best of this. It's okay, you know, lot, lots of rappers have supported a tour. How are you gonna put out your own project? Lots of rappers have dropped a mixtape that's been uncleared. How are you gonna put one together that is cleared? Lots of rappers have won Grammys, but no one's done it unsigned. Okay, we did it. Lots of rappers have thrown their own shows, but no one's done 50,000 people and brought out Kanye West, Alicia Keys, and broken the attendance record at a stadium in Chicago. Okay, how do we get better? I don't know one person who's been on the cover of more magazines than Chance in the last five years. From GQ to Billboard to Complex a couple of times, which... Three? Three, yeah. But yeah, I think that, that guiding principle of just how are you going to be better? How has your relationship with Chance changed over the course of the, you know, five years you guys have been working together? It's changed a lot. You know, like, we were kids when we started. When we first started, I'd go down to 79th Street and pick him up. And, you know, the first thing we, he'd want to do is usually eat. So we'd go to, like, White Castle or McDonald's, and he'd get two cheeseburgers, only cheese, a medium fry, and a large ice, or a medium high C. Still know that, you know? So those are the types of things at the beginning of our relationship that were key. So, you know, you grow, you know, as, as the times change, the relationship changes, but, you know, I think the relationship from us, even in a business sense, starts from love. We care about each other. And um, I know 
um, that he believes that I wouldn't do anything that would ever hurt him, you know, in any sense of the word, in life, personally, professionally, anything. So, um, you know, that with that guiding principle, you know, the it has remained the same, but the stakes have just gotten larger. He called me in, um, I think it was right at the end of January. He called me and said, uh, can you help me move my Christmas tree out of my house? And I was like, oh, of course. And it's sort of like then, you know, and there's, there's so many things along the journey that, you know, you do high level things and low level things. I think in my case, because I'm, I consider myself a selfless person. I try to practice selflessness. And it sort of helped me put it in perspective. And, I, you know, when I talk to other young managers or other people who are aspiring to make a difference in any type of industry, you know, I always say there's nothing too little and there's nothing too big. Like when Chance calls me and asks me about a Christmas tree, I don't go, geez, Chance, like what the hell? You know, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that type of stuff. I'm, I'm saying no problem. And, you know, when he says, you know, I want to have Kanye on my record and, or like this or that, I'm like, no problem. Like, let's fucking get it. Has there ever been a moment where you felt like this might not work out? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, I think if you're not being pushed to those types of limits, you know, you're really not getting the most out of that fruit, the, the fruits of life, the fruits of business. And, uh, you know, if this was easy, anyone would do it, you know? Over the last four or five years, chance has changed a lot between fatherhood and, you know, he's become much more religious and moved away from the worlds of acid and drugs. You know, have you felt like you have grown up as well? Totally. Yeah. I've had anxiety issues and stress issues and I've had uh, friends pass away and I've had amazing experiences like our own festival and the Grammy experience and um, I think what it's all becoming is if you're missing something in your life, you have to identify that and work on that. So I'm, I'm becoming, I think, more in tune with just my myself, my mind, um, and just tapping in with that and being satisfied or more than satisfied about where I'm at with myself. How far forward do you have sort of the game mapped out? <laughs> I would say probably three years, you know, in like a t completely detailed map, you know. It's a completely detailed map for three years? Yeah, I would say that, you know, so. Where, I do, you, where do you want to be? I want to I wanna help more artists achieve amazing things, like Chance has achieved. Um, and I want to help them do it the right way, like Chance has done it. And that's been really fun. I want to uh, work in, in things that interest me outside of just music. We started a film and TV division here in Chicago at Hate Brand. And um, recently we started a sports division here. We want to become sports agents because players deserve better agents. You know, it's very, very ugly, very competitive. We want to be uh, some solid people in that industry and same, same with the film industry as well. So I want to be great. I want to be a big deal. And I think that's half the battle. You know, I want to be like Jimmy. I want to be like Dre. I want to be like Paul Rosenberg. Um, I want to be like Noah, you know? Uh, we have, you know, a lot, a lot of lives yet to live. And I, you know, I don't want to seem like uh, a kid in a candy shop because what Chance and I have done, you know, the little amount of time has been incredible. But um, I'm looking forward to changing the world even more, changing business even more, um, and being positive and spreading positivity and, and optimism along the way. I'm proud of the fact that um, I could have sat on my ass, went to college and got a job, and that would have been easy as fuck. <laughs> Getting up, making the sacrifices, fighting my parents about dropping out of school, working with a young rapper, and doing it all on your own, that shit was fucking hard. And that's my metal, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what makes me me. I didn't have to do this shit, but I did it because I fucking wanted to, because I love it, because it pulled me in. You know, if I can do what I've done in the music space without having any type of background, like, what are other people capable of? What are we all capable of, right? I think that makes me feel good, you know?
I didn't know shit about this stuff. And to be able to do and experience the things that I've done and experienced in this short amount of time in the game, it's been incredible. I just hope more people do what calls them. Who knows what could happen?